Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for coming along this evening and reflecting on your extraordinary profession and vocation. Um, here now you write for The Standard and various other newspapers. You've written a hundred books. And of course, you're at the BBC as well as the BBC Sports Editor. So you've, unusually for journalists, ranged across all those outlets. Could I begin by asking you, I'll ask you about some of the people who you've got to know in that world, but that very question, it seems to me now, more than politics, sport is so controlled by the compelling charisma and fear induced by some of the managers and players, their own representatives, that people like you can't really get very close to them. I love football. I really don't understand what goes on behind the scenes because I would depend on journalists to do it and it's almost impossible for you to get close to what's really going on. Is that fair or do you think some of you are still able to do that? No, that's very fair. That, that's been the big change in sports journalism. Uh, when I first started, or when I was first starting, sports journalists actually mixed, if you like, with the players and they were part of the same... Um, fraternity. I remember my first year in sports journalism, um, Colin Cowdery um, uh, broke up with his wife and um, I had to report that. And when I asked a very senior cricket correspondent, Colin Cowdery of course, a legendary England cricket captain, he said, yes, of course I've known that for five years, but I wouldn't report it. Colin is a friend of mine. Yeah. You know, I mean, he wouldn't last in his job today. I mean, that is the big difference that A, if you like, sport has become news. In, in those days, sport was just you reported the event. You didn't report anything beyond that. And what has happened in football is that the manager has become news. You see, there's a camera constantly trained on what the manager is doing in the dugout. Mm. But that was never the case when I first started watching football or even reporting football. Now, if you like Mourinho, I mean, even my wife who doesn't much care about football, when Mourinho first came, said, it's a very handsome man. He doesn't do work. <laughs> you know, it's that sort of thing, you know. Yeah. And, and exposed to what he, Fergie time, you know, all this. Sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, the manager has become in some ways more important than the player. And, and therefore, if you like, the manager has become, if you like, the, the actor manager in, this, in the stage sense of the word. Yeah. And he's the one you focus on. What does he say? And you get very limited access. Before yeah. a match, a manager will give a press conference for about 15, 20 minutes. And uh, Ferguson, of course, was notorious at Old Trafford that he would actually say to journalists, if he didn't like them, you know, he would throw them out. Out. Yeah. The only time he couldn't do it was if it was the UEFA Champions League match. Because UEFA says, you know, you've got to say he would suffer that. But apart from that, he would, at Old Trafford, when it was a Manchester United match, he could decide who was in or who was out. So which politicians can't do it. Politicians couldn't do that. They would be, they would be out <laughs> within yeah. seconds if they told a journalist to leave a press conference. Which just goes to show, in the sort of topsy-turvy world we live in at the moment, politicians are reviled for being over-mighty and arrogant and intolerant of criticism and all this stuff now about the Royal Charter and the press regulation. They would dare do to journalists what managers can do to all of you. I mean, it is extraordinary the power they have over that medium, isn't it? Yeah, and, and what has happened is, in a way, um, you could say it's uh, people in sports are reporting things. For instance, the famous incident, if you remember, after England won the Ashes, certain of the England players decided that the oval pitch wasn't enough water, so they, you know, <laughs> they produced their own water. You yeah. remember yeah. that moment. <laughs> now, a few years ago, somebody said to me, listen, even at the journal, now, the Australian journalists had seen it, and of course, having lost, they sort of reported it, as you would expect the Australian journalists to do. But nevertheless, the, the, the serious point there is some years ago, that wouldn't have been reported, perhaps. Now, yeah. that is new. That, you know, if you like... We have gone in sports beyond just reporting what, what people do on the field of play. Whereas in politics, you've always reported, to a certain extent, beyond what politicians are saying or, or you know, are, are claiming to do. Yeah. So let me ask you a serious question about football, and then I'll ask a general one about cricket and let you expand on that a bit before we widen it. First of all, personally, have you ever felt... I have such good access to X, Y, or Z. Um, I don't know, manager of Spurs, you're a Spurs supporter. Mm -hmm. I will hold back on criticising them or the team because in this mad world of football, they have such power over us, I will lose access. Have you ever 
made no, I, I have never made that decision, but fortunately, I have been much more, though I've done my match reporting, I've been much more of a sports news reporter. Yeah. So the, so the, the chap who's reporting spurred every day and said, and I've got nothing to do with this guy, you know, he's a, he's a total maverick, you know, he's about to be sacked or something like that, you, yeah. know, you know, that sort of thing. So you can distance yourself. Uh, I've never been put in that position. Right. But, uh, but, but I know certain journalists who, who, who've had to be careful because then the football manager could say, sorry, you've got no access. And so there's a little bit of news, like, you know, who's had a, you know, a thigh strain and not going to play or, you know, done his, you know, whatever it is and, and is not fit. You know, you don't even get that news. Yeah. And the opposite question, in a way, have you got to know through, you know, your time at the BBC, your extensive time with some of the best newspapers in the country, uh, have you got to know them in a way that you could tell me more about them than perhaps the sort of caricatures we get most of the time? Do you feel you know, we'll come on to cricket in a moment, but in football, uh, do you feel you know some of these managers? You know some of them, not all of them. You wrote a book on Venom. Yes, didn't? well... I mean, that, that was considered an anti-Venables book because, you know, Venables was doing all sorts of things. He was, yeah. was inventing pubs in order to raise money to buy spurs. So, you know, yeah. That was quite an interesting thing to do um, <laughs> in a certain way. And, uh, and that probably didn't thrill him No, it didn't thrill him at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got to know, I mean, for instance, somebody like, I got to know David Pleat very well. And, who you know, managed Spurs who for managed a time. Spurs, yeah. who, who's actually quite... I got to know Roy Hodgson very well. Oh, and you? I can see, I can understand. I know what he said was probably inappropriate, but I can understand why he would have used the word monkey in the way he did, because, you know, this is a man who goes to the opera, you know, who's, who's an intellectual, and he, he thought that the players would understand what, what monkey and NASA meant, and, you know, the modern generation has never heard of NASA, so, you know, <laughs> understand what it meant. But, yes, I, I've got to know some of them. I wouldn't say all of them. Some of them, yes. And, and do you, Hodgson, sorry for those of you who don't, he manages England now, I don't, I don't know the level of interest in football here, but... Um, uh, you clearly like and rate Hodgson. Yeah, and Hodgson is very interesting. He's, a, he's an interesting example of an Englishman who, who confesses that he was not good enough to be a player, not good enough to become a manager or you know be get sort of you know in the line to be a manager. So goes abroad and you know actually can speak two or three languages. I mean, most English managers you meet, you, you wonder if, if they can speak English. The, 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 the joke is that when Jurgen Klinsmann, the German, came to. Tottenham Hotspur, I don't know how many of you know, but Tottenham Hotspur is considered to be a Jewish club, though I'm not Jewish myself, but you know, a lot of people who are not Jewish are supporters of Tottenham, and it was said that um, Jürgen Klinsmann's English was better than Sol Campbell, you know, and <laughs> so, you know, who was a great Tottenham player and so on. Yeah. But, you know, a, a, and, and Roy Hodgson is a man who, who reads books, he reads Philip, Philip Roth. Roth, you know, yeah. now, you know having, imagine, you know, imagine Harry Redknapp reading than Philip Roth, I mean, that would be very interesting to find out. <laughs> and he would think, you know, can I sign Philip Roth to Mark David Beckham? Yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> um, do you think with Hodgson, it's almost, he's sort of dangerously intellectual. You mentioned the communication breakdown that became a huge yeah. news story at half-time during the last England game, where basically Hodgson was accused of being a racist with this monkey reference. Is he almost too well-read to communicate with the players, or do you, do you sense he's going to be a real success, because they're now in the World Cup? I hope he'll be a success, but his problem is he doesn't have a rapport with the, with the, with the back pages, you know. The, you know. They would have been more comfortable with Harry, because Harry would have given them a story, you see. Oh. Harry would have given them a top line. Because, you know, when they're filing a story, you know, it's very hard to file a story on, on the, on, on the menace of Sebastian Fawkes, you know, in, in relation to football, you know. I mean, you know, that doesn't make a top line, you know. And, and, and Harry would have given that. And Venables was very good at that. He, he yeah. knew exactly what to turn around and say, you know, if he lost a match, you know, he would say, that offside decision. So suddenly, you know, Venables rages at offside, becomes a headline. Yeah. And, you know, that, that, that is where Roy has a problem, you know. Another form of sports journalism, which is, I think, unique to sport is this ghostwriting that goes on. I was saying to Mahir while we were talking uh, beforehand that I've just uh, recently read the biography written by Harry Redknapp, who was Spurs manager. And about halfway through, there's a paragraph where Harry apparently writes, um, I left school unable to read or write, and I still can't read or write. <laughs> Reading is good. It's the most surreal sort of mad experience. And, um, and of course, it was ghostwritten by a journalist. By, by a very good journalist. By a very Samuel. good journalist who could write yeah, extremely well. Which raises another really interesting question. There is no equivalent in politics. I mean, Tony Blair genuinely wrote his memoir 
Um, so did the others, which is one of the reasons why a lot of them are unreadable. But, <laughs> but they are authentic. And no journalist would ever ghostwrite a politician's memoir. And yet, clearly, for some journalists, this is a very lucrative trade to become the voice of the people they are supposedly reporting on. And, and the one reason they're doing it, apart maybe from the money, is that that means they're getting access. If you're, yeah. if you're ghostwriting for Stephen Gerrard or David Beckham, you are sitting with him, you are interviewing him. But that, that's again, I mean, of course, Harry is a unique person. I mean, Harry could open an offshore account and sign the papers, and when he was asked in court, how did he do that? Did he know he was doing something that was not proper? He said, I was worried about who's going to mark David Beckham. Now imagine, you know, if you came up in a court case and you said, yes, I opened an offshore account, and I was worried what I was going to write in my column, you know, how, how that would go down. But, you know, yeah. Harry could get away with that. But you see, what Alex Ferguson has done is quite remarkable, and that shows how sport has changed, how football has changed. He's had two of our best sports writers. I, I grew up with... Hugh McIlvanny, I used to wake One up every Sunday morning sports, right? and get the Observer and read Hugh McIlvanny. It was a pleasure to read him. And Paul Hayward, who I've worked with, I've had the privilege of working with, you know, he's written his second, what is his, essentially his second volume of his memoirs, which have just come out. And, and I couldn't have imagined a few years ago um, uh, sports writers of that eminence wanting to ghost books in, 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 in that sense, certainly not McIlvanny or, or Hayward. But one reason they do it is the access. And I remember McIlvanny, when he wrote about Ferguson, this was um, years ago when both of us were the Sunday Times, he would, he would want the Sunday Times to um, fax him, in those days of faxes, not only the, the, what he had written, but the headline, in case um, Ferguson was upset. You know, it was that sort of, you know, that sort of relationship, yeah. that sort of bond. Of course, they're both Scots and so on, so you know, they, are, they have the tradition going back. But nevertheless... They, they don't want to upset that relationship. No. You know, even somebody like Michael Benny could be very controversial. Yes, yeah. And write beautifully. And write beautifully. Um, and I think was genuinely fond of Ferguson. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They, um, just a couple of other things about uh, football before we talk briefly about other areas of your interest. We were talking earlier, and in a way, it is quite extraordinary, isn't it, what is happening to football in terms of our entire country and the, what we all live through, in that clubs are being bought up by powerful Arab states, in the case, I think, of Manchester City. I mean, it's like, you know, there's a huge fuss when a nuclear power station is bought by China, uh, as has happened in the last couple of weeks, in fact, and, and mm-hmm. about France. And yet, when uh, entire countries buy up football clubs, uh, there's no... Uh, the fans are thrilled because it means more money mm-hmm. coming in. They say, oh, that's great, you know. Some tyrant has brought our club. Fantastic, you know. Um, do you think this is dangerous? How irrational is that tribal loyalty? Because this has all happened in the period you've been reporting on this sport. I mean, that is one another major change that's happened, and I think we have allowed something to happen without thinking about it. Roman Abramovich suddenly gets in. I mean, the word was he his helicopter was was flying over West London. And he, 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 he actually fancied Fulham, but he mistook Fulham for Chelsea, so he, he bought Chelsea, you know. Uh, I know he actually looked at Tottenham as well. But, you know, but this man has never given an interview. It, yeah. We know nothing about it. Yeah. He has never publicly said anything, yeah. and yet he's completely revolutionised football. We, I mean, we have to assume he's, he's made his money where he's made his money, but, you know, we know very little about him. And in business, this this would not have happened, you know. No. There, there is been, some level of yeah, accountability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Accountability, who is? And in, in the case of Manchester City, it's even worse in some ways. The Abu Dhabi state buys a club where the stadium they, 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 they play in is, is, is made by the British taxpayer. Now, if it had been put in a referendum that we are going to build a stadium to host the Commonwealth Games, and a few years later, we are going to rent it out to the Abu Dhabi state, you know, people would have said, you know, I mean, even more than the European referendum, it would never have, you know, got, got passed. And, and the same thing could happen with the Olympic Stadium. West Ham are going to play in it, and three years down the line, who knows, you know? Could be sold. Could be sold. So and, you know, Olympic Stadium could yeah, be And I think by. we believe that this is a free market. And maybe my worry is that we have allowed, because of the change, you know, in the whole situation, we, we should learn our lesson from America, where they have... Sporting socialism, where their where their sports clubs are owned by sort of Tea Party Republicans, who in terms of sport believe that you've got to have some sort of equity, you've got to have some sort of balance, because otherwise the danger is football. At the end of the day, must be a community sport. When I go to football, I'm suddenly, or you and I, if you go to Tottenham, we're suddenly part of the family. You know, we're not going to. Oh, 
you and I are friends, but you know, we're not going to, the, the people you're watching, you, you don't send them Christmas cards or even, you know, visit their homes or know where they live. But that moment, when they score a goal, you might, you know, you might even hug and kiss somebody, you know, you, who you're never going to um, invite to your house ever. And you know, that sense of community, if you suddenly just bring in some foreign capital which comes in without any examination of why they're coming in, what it means. And the NFL is very interesting in America. You cannot buy an NFL club without all the other NFL clubs sitting down and agreeing to that purchase. Yeah. So yeah. They, 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 they do try in their own way, the Americans, to keep that link. And my, my fear is that that link is probably, you know, because Sportsmith at one stage was bought and sold by five people. And one of them turned out to be an Arab with no money, you know. Yeah. You know and, and one of them turned out to be an invisible Arab. Yeah. In, in terms of that sort of communal experience, it's very interesting. When I uh, bought the season ticket at Spurs with my son, in the row behind us, di- sitting directly behind me, and these weren't posh seats, they were some of the cheaper seats, it was Jude Law, who's a Spurs <laughs> supporter. And talk about, you know, this hugging thing. Every time Spurs scored, I was hugged by Jude <laughs> Law. <laughs> well, that a good experience? And I would tell all these sort of teenage girls, you know, I keep on being hugged by Jude Law. It's terrible. Um, do you think that there is any justification for that communal experience? You said, I think you said you even tried to persuade your wife that you will feel yeah. you belong to something. Well, my wife said, why don't you support Arsenal? I said, you know, it's easy to change wife. You can't change... You, you know, can't put on top. <laughs> but, but given what you know, and you, your latest book has been about the whole extraordinary premiership phenomenon, which is you know, just as an industry, something worthy of study like banks and all the rest of it. It's been unbelievable. Do you think that other side, that kind of primitive, tribal, communal feeling, which made football such an attractive thing for people to do in the 30s, in grim situations, and then when it all started up again in the 50s and 60s, is now completely irrational? You you, you just look at it knowing what you know about who run these clubs and the nomadic world of these rich footballers going from place to place. And do you look at those 40,000 people that you are bonkers? <laughs> or do you still feel that somehow or other, sport, we're talking football, we'll come on to cricket in a minute, does pr- create an extraordinary bonding, communal yeah, I, moment, I even think, if it's just a moment? For I moment. think what sport does is it, it links cultures in a way that nothing else does, you see. Music doesn't, in my opinion, because you've got to understand the culture. But to understand Lionel Messi, all you need to know is the offside rule. Uh, you know, and, and yeah, a few other things that, that I don't know. <laughs> I don't know a single word of Spanish, but I can see that Lionel Messi is a great player. You know, th- that is where sport has that ability to go across cultures, you know, and, and, and make you feel. And also, there's another thing about sport, which, is, which you'll never lose. When you, when, you know, and I've played sport, and I'm sure you've played sport, you know, when you play sport, you know you're not that good. My, my wife, for instance, plays tennis every Saturday, and occasionally, and her great heroine was Steffi Graf, and occasionally she'll come back and say, you know, that forehand was just like Steffi Graf. You know, that, yeah. that moment of feeling, that, yeah, that one stroke. I yeah. probably, she's not, I mean, Steffi Graf is not as good as her, in my opinion, but, you know, <laughs> the, <laughs> point is, the, the, the point is that that moment that you can, you can just be for a brief second, Whereas, you know, if you give a, if you give a pianist, you know, um, um, and expect him to play, he, he, he wouldn't even come up to Liberace standards, you know, he'd, be, he'd just be like Auntie Maud, you know. <laughs> that's a, that, that is the difference in sport. It yeah. can get you, it will get you that sense of illusion, that, you know, yes. you can really, for a brief moment, be as good as the best in the world. Yeah. And I think nothing else can. So as long as that is there, and this ability to, if you like, cross cultures, or, through languages, race, and what have you, I think sport will be important. And also, at the end of the day, you can't predict the outcome of sport, you know. Yeah. You know, if you see a play, in the, in the end of the day, even all Shakespeare's plays, we know what the ending is. Yes. You know, they may yes. be wonderful productions. But, uh, but, but as, as you, you know, said there at the beginning yeah. of the game, you have no idea. <laughs> no, you have no idea what the will unfold yeah. for the 90 minutes. Uh, I know your great passion is cricket. <laughs> And I'll ask you why in, in a moment. And, and also there, again, you sort of probe more deeply than many other journalists in exposing some very dark sides to the game that you absolutely love. Um, you'll have to explain to me why you love it. I remember pa- Michael Parkinson, who shares your passion for cricket, saying that he tried to explain once the rules of cricket to an American, and he talked all the way through, and the American said, wow, and you do all that on horseback? Um, and, um, and I kind of share that sort of American's uh, 
incomprehension. So tell us about how you, I think it is the game you feel most passionate about, just yes. beyond uh, football. I, I personally think that I agree with Neville Carter when he says everything about England could be destroyed by the laws of cricket and you could re recreate England, you see. And I think this is the only game. There are two things about cricket. Baseball is, to an ex extent, the same. The two sets of players are doing different things. You see, in football or in rugby, they're both doing the same thing. They're both trying to either score a try or stop the person scoring a try. Whereas in cricket, the, the batsman is trying to score runs and the bowler is trying to get him out. So they're actually do, doing two very different... And there are 11 players fielding, only two people, two people two batting. People, yeah. And secondly, only the English, I think, could have invented cricket, which I think shows the greatness of the, of the English, that you have to get a decision, you have to appeal to somebody else generally a man in white, you know, you, I mean in football you can appeal as much as you like, the referee will either give you a penalty or not give you a penalty, the appeal is totally irrelevant, yeah. he might even book you if you appeal too much, whereas in cricket, apart from the fact when you're bowled, you have to actually appeal, so if you don't appeal for an LBW, you will not get an LBW, and, and, and I think cricket in a way, again, this business of culture, you have to say how's that, and even somebody like Inzuman ul a great Pakistani cricketer, who's, who's you know, with great respect to Inzi, um, English was not his first language, you know, and I mean, one doesn't know what his first language was at times, but you know, <laughs> the point is that, you know, he could say, how's that? You know, I mean, if you can extend that, I think, I think that, is the, that is the greatness of cricket. And ultimately, if you think about it, um, cricket is the only game where there's a team called the West Indies when, when there isn't a nation called the West Indies. I remember one BBC foreign correspondent saying, I've been looking at this map and I can't find the West Indies. Where is the West Indies? Not only in cricket, could you have a team which represents a collection of 11 islands, which seems a nation, but is only a nation on the cricket team? Yeah, yeah. And um, you have also, I mean, in football, you wrote a book called Manchester Dish United, and the Venables book, you said, had some sort of dark things in there which didn't please it. And I think also you've done quite a lot of investigating... In, in, in the world of cricket as well. So yeah, what has happened in cricket is there used to be more than a century, century and a half ago, match fixing. But what has happened in cricket is very interesting. Cricket is the one game that has gone out of Western control. All the sport, you know, one talks of West you know, declining, China coming, but all the sport is actually run. You know, it was, most games were invented, or the rules were at least invented in this country, spread from this country, and most games are run either by the by the Europeans or by the British. Whereas cricket is the game where India now has 80% of world cricket's income. And what has happened in India, they still have the old betting laws that this country had before 1960, which means the only legal bet is on the racetrack. And therefore everything apart from that is an illegal bet. And that has encouraged a whole... It has pushed what may be a legal bet into the arms of the, of the, of the, of the, of the criminal gangs. And yeah. I'm afraid cricketers have been tempted... And, and many of those criminal gangs have worked out that you can, you can, you can, if you like, get a cricketer to bowl a few no balls, and they might feel we are not, we're not throwing anything. We're just bowling a few no balls, or you know, drop the odd catch, or even an umpire give a decision, and you get, you know, fifty thousand pounds in cash or whatever. You get that, and that has happened. You know, yeah. that is unfortunately the case, and and the betting situation is not regulated enough. Cricket hasn't paid enough attention to the fact that people like all of us, I suppose, we are all open to corruption and if you feel you can get away with it. Yeah. And, 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 and some cricketers not well paid, you know, have, have, this has happened. Could, and this, could, has been, this has been very, very uh, tragic and very sad because once you remove that element, that if, if, a, uh, if a sports performer is not performing, uh, he may be good or bad, but if he's perf not performing well because he's taking money, then you have no faith in what he's doing. And has that disillusioned you? I mean, you clearly had heroes in cricket, and they got to know heroes. It's one of the joys of journalism, you get to know your heroes. Has that disillusioned you at all? Yes, I think what happened with the Pakistani cricketers, you know, where they actually fell for a sting of the, the news of the yeah. world, you know, that, yeah. that is, you know, and there were some very good cricketers that you, you, you felt, if you're watching next time, somebody take five wickets... Is that really five wickets he's taken, or had he, did he have a deal with the batsman? Or you know, if you can't believe that, it, it, it makes you feel that almost anybody could be corrupted, corrupted by, by the process. And that that is, you know, you, you don't have that belief that if, if if something happened on the cricket field, that is a genuine thing, or whether you know, who knows? If he dropped that catch, was it a genuine catch, or was it, you know, what was he? Did he drop it because you know he was on ten thousand pounds to drop the catch, whatever it is? Yeah. And who are your heroes? In cricket? In sport, generally. Oh, you know, I, I grew up um, 
worshipping the Tottenham Hotspur double team, and I, you know, people like uh, footballers like Pelé. Um, um, I mean, I think. Uh, have you met Pelé? I have yeah. met Pelé. Have you I, interviewed him? Yes, I have. I mean, what he, do you think of Pelé? Well, I think he's a better footballer than Drew. Is he to be interviewed? He's, he's not a great talker. talker. In the, not yeah. a great talker. It's rather um, charming. Isn't charming it? man, but not not a great talker. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think I, I've, ha- I've had the pleasure of um, meeting some 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 you know tennis players like Rod Laver and and, and, and so on. And you know there have been some, some some great players. And also, of course, cricketers like yeah. Tendulkar and so on. You know, they're, they're, they're quite remarkable. Rahul Dravid. Yeah. Um, and even one would say people like David Gar and so on, you know, they, they are quite, um, I mean, they're quite sort of straightforward in that sense. Yes. The modern cricketers tend to be less so. They are hedged in by... Um, like the footballers. To like the, the footballers. I mean, I, I, I recently interviewed Stuart Broad, and that was only because it was arranged through a, a PR agency, and I was told, just before I interviewed him, a call away to one side, I said, I was told you cannot ask him about what happened at the Oval when the England cricketers relegated, you know, otherwise yeah. the interview will stop. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's that sort of thing, you know, which is a bit sad, but, you know, because you want to talk to them about it. And, and some of them can be, can, be, can be a bit worried about their commercialism and so on. Which, again, couldn't happen in political interviews. It couldn't happen. If they laid down those kind of conditions. I don't think an interview would go ahead, actually. Mm-hmm. And, you, 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 and, and often, very interesting, um, about a year ago, I was asked to interview Karagonis, the, the Greek um, uh, football captain who has just started playing in Fulham. And I got to, uh, I got, you know, I got through a contact, got to know him, interviewed him. And then the Fulham uh, PR person rang me up and said, you can't run the interview. I said, what do you mean? He said, no, you have interviewed him without our permission. I said, you know, uh, what are you, MI5? Or what, you know, what is it? And I've got to interview Karagalis, you know. Be, he said, no, no, you can't. And, you know, this will ruin our relationship with, with the standing of the paper. You know, obviously Fulham is a, is a London club and so on. And, and eventually, it, 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 you know, we nearly at the risk of rupturing relations. I said, I'm going to run the interview, you know. And, yeah. what, and what happened? Well, Did they, they, they didn't say anything. You right. know, in the end, it, it was all right. But, you know, Al Fayed was about to give me an interview, and he didn't, which is just as well, because I don't know what Al Fayed would have said. He would have said, you know, Michael Jackson is a great footballer. You know? <laughs> <laughs> which he probably is. Who knows? Who knows? Who knows? I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I was told he was a great left back. It always reminds me of what Jackson. You were, well, what Harry Harris, you know, oh, my <laughs> colleague said, when he went to Bethlehem, uh, when England were playing, and he said, uh, that I'm reporting from the um, world-famous birthplace of Jesus Christ. What he didn't say was Jesus Christ played left-back for Bethlehem, for, for <laughs> Nazareth. You know? <laughs> but it wasn't a good left-back. Not a brilliant left-back. <laughs> no. Not one of the great left-backs. One of the interesting things, coincidentally, actually, when I think about it, of the uh, four journalists featuring in this journalist on stage sequence is that they've all done the BBC and newspapers. It's interesting with Polly Toynbee, as some of you were witness last night. She is a, a person of strong opinions, which she is now free to express. You know, uh, as some of you will know what they they are. But for a time in the 80s, a highly and early 90s, she was the BBC social affairs yeah, yeah. editor. And she was telling me afterwards last night, some of you who were here last night will find this really funny, you should do this. So she's really embarrassed on YouTube there is Polly's report of it from Finchley on the day Margaret Thatcher was uh, removed as Prime Minister. And Polly, because she had to be impartial, you know, you know what her views are like, almost looked tearful. Uh, <laughs> uh, and apparently, if you, if you Google Polly Toynbee Thatcher on YouTube, you see this report of Polly being utterly impartial in BBC. Um, now you went from uh, the world of uh, print to the BBC's uh, sports editor. How did you find the different outlets? Well, that's very interesting what you raised because the BBC is very sensitive to the sport. The the, the title is a sports editor. Yeah. They don't want you to go out on a limb. So, for instance. I had a blog, and I couldn't write in my blog that I was a Tottenham Hotspur supporter. You know, you know, no, I couldn't. And, and this was because, you know, because otherwise there would be hundreds of thousands of responses from Arsenal supporters. And obviously, you, you, know, you can't. You know, and, and it always amazes me. You watch football because you start supporting a, a club at a, at a very, you know, you don't expect to become the BBC sports editor or even have any thought about it. You're a young, young boy growing up. So, you know, you, but BBC was very sensitive. And also, they were very, very sensitive on discussing any issues of race. Oh, really? Yes, they were very sensitive because Why? I was close. I, because they got a lot of response on the blog um, about, you know, you know, as you remember, I don't know if you remember, but Sol Campbell, 
um, when Tottenham played Portsmouth, because Sir Campbell had left Tottenham to go to Arsenal, was considered Judas, he got a lot of yeah. abuse. Yeah. And I wanted to report on that, because through the 80s, I, I saw some pretty dreadful scenes in football. I got beaten I up bet. myself. Did you? Yes. On, yeah. And, and, and oh. you know, there was a lot of racism. You know, that was there. On the, on the, and, and I wanted to write about it, and the BBC said, no, 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 no you can't. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. They were very... The BBC, you know, people talk of left and right. The BBC is actually very sensitive about appearing to be in any way um, uh, upsetting anybody, and sometimes you have to say things which uh, you know which upset people. You say you have to say X happened or Y happened, and and and, the B, and, and there were constraints. We, the newspaper world wouldn't have been constrained. Yeah. You know, in the newspaper they would say, "Fine, you're yeah. right." Yeah. You know, and the BBC is very timid in that sense. You know, yeah. very very. You know, uh, it's not. You know, you do a story, you want sort of five different sources before before they allow you to run the story. Yeah, yeah. It is an interesting compromise. I remember recently actually asking Andrew Marr. Um, because Andrew Ma used to write political columns at The Independent, which I do now, and I sometimes look back at his columns, you know, they're all there in the building. And A, they were beautifully written, but B, quite opinionated, uh, and, and recognisably from a part of the political spectrum. And I, so I ask him quite often, you have all these views, do you resent not being able to express them? And he said only about two or three times a day. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, 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 but of course, what you do get is fame and 10 million watching you, that's true. rather than a few hundred thousand, if you're lucky, <laughs> reading I know, and that's And that's presumably what broadcasting gets. It's yeah. a big audience. It, it does get a big audience, and you do reach out to people. And, and of course, fewer and fewer people are reading newspapers. Yeah. What do you think about that, finally? And then we'll open it up for a wider... I mean, I, I, I think my worry is that newspapers, our profession, if you like, is reacting wrongly to the, to the spread of media. They're, they're trying to become celebrity news, you know, and what, the, what they should do is actually good reporting, and, 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 and people will still buy. I mean, you know, we live in the most competitive newspaper industry in the world. Yeah. Well, we still have 11 newspapers, which is, you know, in America, if you go to most cities, they have one or two newspapers. But, but at the end of the day, if you don't report news well, you, you will die anyway. So I think... It's much better to do that rather than go in for celebrity journalism, which, yeah. which I think has been the big, if you like, you know, David Beckham is an interesting person, but David Beckham dominating the news is, is not the way, in my opinion, to, to, to go. And it's interesting that the Times is currently yeah. serialising yeah. Beckham's yeah. 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 And, book, and that has become, which is a really yeah, yeah. interesting And place. also that, again, is, is an access matter, because they serialise. Beckham gives an interview, you know, oh, and, and, they, they, and, and they get a new story out of it, and then other people follow what is the uh, just since we mentioned Beckham? Explain to me the Beckham phenomenon. He wasn't that brilliant a footballer, and yet he is probably one of the most famous people on the planet. Well, what he did idolized. What he the did was he first of all, if you remember, Beckham's career nearly ended in that match against Argentina when he got yeah. sent off. Yeah, you know, yeah. the mirror headline was was uh, uh, ten lion-hearted, one idiot. You know, yeah. and he he reinvented himself, and and I think also. The, the, he, he married a so-called singer. I never thought the Spice Girls could sing, you know. Little, you know, but nevertheless, he, he, he did a he did a very very shrewd marriage, if you like. And then he marketed himself very cleverly. He he went to he went to um, Spain at the right time, and he did all the things where, if you like, he, he you know if you like, I mean, he, he comes from more or less the same sort of background that John Terry and many of the other footballers. But I think he spent some time educating himself how to present himself, going to America. So he's done that hard work to a certain extent. And he's been very carefully managed by a management company which has made sure his exposure is at the right time and the right image. He's always been very aware of his image and how to project his image. With some of the other footballers, you know, they earn money and they don't, sort of, you know, they, they don't worry about the image. Whereas Beckham from the beginning had been very, very careful in how he projects his image. Yes. Do you know him? Have yes, you yes. Time? But not much time, but you know, do you, do you, you don't. Like him? I, I think, I think, I think he's, a, he's a highly educated person in that sense. Educated, yeah, self-educated. Self-educated yeah. and, and aware and, and knows. You know, for instance, he is credited with having won London the Olympics, which is, which is absolute nonsense. But he was there in Singapore. Yeah. He, was, he was presenting. I mean, actually, the person who won the Olympics was Sepko and, and, and Keith Mills and, and Tony and Sheree Blair. I mean, IOC members are hard-boiled members. They wouldn't be <laughs> voting for London on the basis. But Beckham was there presenting himself. And that was yeah. very good, the way you know, one, one got to know him a bit, the way he was ready to you know, put, put, a, you know, put himself about, talk to various people and things like that. It was quite interesting to watch him in operation. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Mayor. Let's now... Um 
uh, widened out to um, uh, you here uh, gathered at the Tara Arts Centre for day two of journalists on stage. Who would like to um, start the discussion with uh, a question? question. Um, I can't, sorry, did someone say, yeah, sorry, on the front, yeah. Okay, here, yeah. Um, you talked about the cosy relationship between the press and the sports journalists and the footballers and the manual for the years gone by. Um, I wonder if you think now these sports journalists let the public down. How does it let, let the public down when they were doing this? Because there's some stories that still bug me today, like Bobby Moore, Stephen Bracer in Bogotá. What happened there? And I, I read, I think it was in Harry's book, or I read it recently, that there was a relationship. They didn't, they didn't publish a story for five days. In those five days, those facts have been blurred. And, and still today, we don't know about Paul Bobby Moore, whether he stole that bracer or not. As well, well it's it's really yeah. I've had two versions. One is that he uh, did take the bracelet. I know he's one of England's most revered footballers and the only one to hold aloft the World Cup. And the other, that he was covering up for somebody else in the team. We don't know. There are, yeah, there are journalists. My point is, do you think that the public went down by Yeah, I think, but you see, we were living then in a different world. We, we, in a way, if you you think back, I mean, Steve will know more about this, Uh, Harold Macmillan's wife had an affair with somebody and that was never reported. Now, if that happened today, I can't imagine David Cameron's wife having an affair with somebody. So we were, to a certain extent, living in a different world. I mean, I always think that uh, what was not reported is that um, Peter Bonetti was a secret Conservative Party agent because the goals he let in, three days later, (laughs) Labour was thrown out. He must have been (laughs) a secret Conservative Party agent. If you see the goals he let in, how he could have let the Germans in in those moments, I don't know. Otherwise, or probably he was a a pseudo-German, who knows? But, uh, <laughs> but it, it, that, I mean, that Bobby Moore story is that it's very interesting that you raise that because it is an illustration of a completely different era, isn't it? I mean, if those are the only two options, he was either covering up somebody else or he stole it, um, now all hell would break loose. Um, to the point that if he was innocent, he would be in trouble, actually. And, and it's it, gone the, almost the other way. I, I take your point absolutely that we were never informed. I remember. Well, I just wonder why five days reported yeah. it. it was a great story. The England captain woke up. Yeah, why? Some newspapers. And to this day, I, I, I think we, we don't know. Poor Bobby went to his grave, but it's still hanging over him because of failure of journalists, sports journalists. I, I accept that, but it, yeah. the story was that. Ramsey took them on the plane and just said, off we are going, you don't talk about it. This is the man who had won the World Cup for, for, for England, the manager and so on. And, and to a certain extent, in those days, you've got to realise that the footballers and the players were, were going to the same bar, they were mates. So, you know, you didn't cross your mate, even if you knew about footballers it. Footballers and the journalists. Yeah, so, footballers and the journalists, yeah. they were, you know, which they don't do now, to a certain extent. Yeah. You know. More or less. So we, and also the, you know, and and uh, and you're a good example of that. There are sports news reporters, news reporters who have come on the scene who are reporting the wider scene in the way. And, and again, you've got to understand that in those days, um, sports pages was at the back of the book, you know, and and there wasn't wasn't all that much attention paid to other aspects of sport except the, the match report, you know, what had happened on the field of play. What what do you think is is healthier? Maybe you've got a view as, as well on this. Um, the era now where if Bobby Moore, if there were any rumours that he had stolen mm. a necklace or whatever it was during a World Cup, on Twitter, within 10 seconds, mm. it would be out there, rumours, Moore is finished, he's stolen this thing, he's going to be arrested, blah, blah, blah. There will be endless blogs, I know Bobby Moore, he wouldn't do it. <laughs> and within an hour, the whole world would know about this story. Do you think that is healthier than journalists being so restrained, so he might have been totally mm-hmm. innocent, um, or that both are deeply unhealthy. There's the possible cover-up, because you all knew each other, or the assumption now of guilt within about a nanosecond of any allegation surfacing. I think that the Twitter thing that we've had is, is, is regrettable, because what Twitter has done is opened the pub door you know, you, in the old days, you would go inside the pub and you would say, that's Steve Richards, you know, he's a complete wanker. But, you know, at the end of the evening, that is where it would remain. Now it's on, now, now it's on Twitter. <laughs> and, you know, it becomes, it becomes established fact. Yeah. That, that yeah. is regrettable. But I think, at the end of the day, if you're going to become... Because what Bobby Moore never became, he never became a role model. But, you know, if you, if you look at Tiger Woods, he was a role model. Still, you know, yeah, Tiger so Woods is, you know, advertising. Or Roger so Federer. Roger Federer is a wonderful tennis player. Yeah. But why should I buy a watch because Roger 
yeah. Federer is wearing one. I mean, is he a watch expert? You know, there's no correlation between his tennis and his watch. Now, if, if footballers or, or sports players are going to become role models, then we need to know a bit more about them. And if they're thieves as well, and, you know, maybe we should buy watches from Roger Federer on the, you know, the same as Roger Federer because he's such a good thief, you know, <coughs> you know that, that would be a good, good uh, um, argument for or against. But the point is, if you're going to do that, then we need more, more facts about them, you know, yeah. what they've done. Sure. You, you can't have them as role models and then pretend that they haven't done certain things. Well, what do you think is healthier, the sort of apparent tendency not to report things because well, they were... I, I mean, I, that be, I'm a journalist, so I would be yeah. fairly my job, I think, if I didn't report even Captain been arrested for stealing a post within half an hour. That's but when you're part of Twitter, I think Twitter is a wonderful thing to do this because when there's a big story breaking, you know, you have, we're all witnesses to what's going on and it's there. I mean, obviously, we're very careful about Wikipedia and Twitter and, you know, you do take the picture sort because not everybody's right the whole time. And as journalists, we're trained to check things. And, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful innovation for us and the amount of newspapers now sell on Twitter pictures and Twitter eyewitness accounts and Facebook and social media. Uh, but I, I always say that you have to be cautious to you know, still you know, be careful. You know, the yeah, I mean, way. provided you check out what is on Twitter. Yeah, that's what I'm not, saying. Not just take yeah. something on Twitter as no, a well, there's something which are on, I'm not controversial, like pictures, pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other things, I mean, if there are, obviously, you, you can't tell us. But it was very interesting. You know, today, I don't know if any of you have seen the news today, but it's, it, it emerged in this court case with Rebecca Brooks and Andy Corson. They were having an affair for six years. This has been known at Westminster for some time. It was hinted at on the front page of the Mail on Sunday. Um, and everyone wondered what the hell they were going on about. Well, this mm-hmm. is what it is. It was some, some, months um, ago. some months ago, they did a big splash, Cameron Rock by a fair, and they didn't say who it was. Well, it, we can now say, because of the court case, it was uh, Coulson and Rebecca Brooks. And similarly at Westminster, and it might be for the reason that you suggested with Bobby Moore, but I think it's a bit more complex than that. When Charles Kennedy, the leader of the Lib Dems, was knocking back Drake like there's no tomorrow, um, it didn't get out, even though we were all aware. But this is where it becomes problematic. We were all aware of the rumours. But I never saw him drunk. Um, so, you know, I'm not... I mean, But anyway, are there still equivalent in the sports world of quite profound... Revelations that you all keep to yourselves? No, I think that the, the, the line I would draw is if Bobby Moore had stolen the bracelet and if I knew about it, if I could, you know... Prove it. Prove it, then obviously one, you know... Yeah. It, but I think the private lives of footballers, you know, that's a different matter. Yeah. You know, who they're yeah. sleeping with, to me, it's, not, it's no. not news. But that is where, if you like, the news has been driven, you know. Yeah, yeah. What Ryan and with Giggs, politics. Yeah, yeah. With and politics. that, you know, what Ryan... But with politicians, to a certain extent, if a politician says, I'm a family man and he's having an affair with, you know... To other people, that that maybe you may consider that to be a breach of what he's promising. But if Ryan Giggs or whoever is having several affairs, it may or may not affect his ability to go down the wings and cross the ball. And yeah. you know uh, yeah. that you know there you've got to draw the line and say why is that an interesting story? Yes, you know that is that is where I think one has to to a certain extent. But I think probably we have gone down the road of celebrity journalism in a big way because yeah. newspapers feel that is what sells. Yes. You know, yeah. rather than analysis. And in this increasingly desperate market. Yeah. 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 Going to play. Who would like to ask another question? Yeah, the guy there. Well, just in addition to this, to, to support what you're saying, um, before the war, I think there were two um, kinds of sports journalism. The first um, concentrated on the kind of game that was being played, and I think particularly of Herbert Chapman mm-hmm. uh, with, with the Arsenal team of the 30s. Uh, he revolutionised the way they were playing. Uh, of course, he brought in some two foreigners. They were Scots. They had a big deal. He brought Alex James down from Scotland. <laughs> uh, and the other is uh, Neville Cardus, who inferred from the way they played the kind of people they were. Now, I don't think there's a certain amount of that now, but would you say that still goes on? What, what has happened? I mean, I, I, I was fortunate. That's cricket, of course. Yeah, no, I was you fortunate to. Have, you don't do it in football, so. yeah, I was fortunate to have met Neville Carlos, and you know, he was one of my great heroes. I was told later on that some of the stories he wrote about were not quite true, you know. But, but uh, that, that is what that has been said. But nevertheless, I, you're quite right. He inferred, but he was writing, if you like, essays. You see, today, because a match is already on television, or you know, everybody knows about it, 
the sports writer really, the match reporter, can't say he passed the ball and scored the goal. He's got to put in a bit of opinion, if you like. Mm. And, and that's one thing. But you still have essays. Simon Barnes, for instance, is, is a wonderful essayist. And, and, and he does. It's very interesting. Simon Barnes reaches out to a lot of people who don't follow sport. My wife, for instance, you know, she never reads my writing because she knows it's crap. But, you know, she always reads Simon Barnes, you know, because to her, you know, it represents what is, what is that evocative form of writing. There is to an extent. But I think what has happened is television has changed everything. When I was a kid growing up, to watch a match, you had to have a ticket to go and see. Now most people watch it on television and they see more of the match then what I, and let me give you a story, example, a real life example, this is the World Cup final of 2006, and uh, I said to my wife, we will go, just as spectators, you know, because who knows when the World Cup will be next in Europe, and we were sitting there with a lot of, um, a, a group of people who were, were not French, but who had come to see Zidane play his last match, and suddenly there was that moment where um, uh, the, the, the French attack was cleared, and the next moment, Buffon was ru- running to the linesman, gesticulating, and, and, and Zidane was sent off. And we had a near riotous situation because nobody explained to us that Zidane, having heard whatever word he'd heard from, from Maserati about his mother or sister or whatever, had headbutted him. You see, that, that, we only saw that incident when we came back to the hotel. So you, you, if you like, you see much more on television. So the whole world to a certain extent has changed. And that has impacted. But, you know, in a certain sense, I, I don't know if... In, even in, in politics it has happened, but to a certain extent, that much of politics is still in the shadows to a certain extent, isn't it? Okay, the Commons is reported and you see, and, and there's much more television, but you can still write about a, 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 a what has happened, yeah. a descriptive thing, whereas most sports writers yeah. can't just say, yeah. you know, David Gow or whoever, you know, um, 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 uh, uh, you know, Al- Al- Alistair, uh, uh, you know, hit, uh, hit the ball this way and got out. He'd have to sort of give you a bit of, um, you know, a, a bit of humour, a bit of weight, a bit of sort of, uh, if you like, a bit of morality there. And that's where reporting had become different. In a way, political journalism is almost the exact opposite because we're told all the time, somewhat depressingly, like say if you're at the Labour Party conference or the Tory Party conference. Right on the assumption that most people won't even know this conference is taking place, <laughs> you know. And while you're there, it's all about will Miliband survive the day, and you're all in this bubble. Most people don't even know it's happening, you know. <laughs> Yours is the exact opposite, in that there is such an obsession with sport now in Britain, especially football. But as you say, I mean, well, how do you go about it? You know that most people interested in the game you're reporting will have seen it live on Sky Television. I mean, the writing challenge. It's the exact opposite of politics, where you work on the assumption no one has seen anything or is remotely interested. And, and, and this is very interesting. They should be. And this is very interesting, Steve. For the match reporter, it's quite difficult because though most of the grounds have television, many of them don't have television. So they are reporting the match in the old days. In the old days, you would have to check, you know, who passed the ball? Was it number nine? You know, you know that sort of thing. You know, and now they are reporting to an audience, um, to to a readership which has already seen the match. And they're, hope, and they're sometimes having to wait and hope that, you know, they've got the thing right and, you know, yeah. what exactly happens. So it, it, that creates its own complexities. Yeah. And you're actually be, in the stadium being deprived of what the, what the crowds at the home or in the pubs uh, can see all the time. And they think, you know, who's this reporter? What did he report? You know, that, that wasn't the, the ball wasn't passed by number nine. It was by, you know, it was a, a hoof that came from number five. What, what's he talking about? You know, and poor chap, he'd probably not seen the television replay when he'd written his report. Yeah, yeah, very. It's a, especially Sunday for Monday. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, that is another complexity we have. That we are the only... Uh, a, a newspaper industry in the world where we have Sunday papers and Monday and Monday papers with a result that in football particularly this is the only thing that, that, that you, can, you can't imagine a match is reported played on Saturday in the Monday papers 24 yeah. hours later yeah. and the p- managers have to have two press conferences you know they have, a, they have what is called a, 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 Monday pre- a, a Sunday conference first if the match is on Saturday and then the, the, the press officer says, right, right, Monday papers only and the Monday boys come in, you know. Oh, really? they've got, oh, they've got to have two press conferences. Because, you know, obviously, you can't have the same because otherwise it'll all come out on the Sunday. So the manager then has to find some other words to say. 
about why this goal was scored, you know, and, you know, and, and, and find something else to say which makes it sound that it's totally different, and, you know, and the guy who writes it for Monday has to put a completely different spin yeah. as to how Townsend scored the goal with his left foot, and both times he used the left foot, which probably bent it to 45 degrees in one way, you know, and then things Sometimes like, you know. I think they almost earn their six million pounds a year. Yeah. <laughs> Two newspaper press conferences and about five yeah, you, Can you imagine? Yeah. Um, and each one, some of them managed to sound fresh in each one. Uh, they should be politicians. Mind you, they asked very searching questions. You know, what, what did you feel when you won 3 0? No? Exactly. You know? yeah. And they say, I absolutely yeah. felt like absolutely dreadful. You know? yeah. I wish we'd be, got beaten. Of course, they don't say that. You know? they, yeah. they mumble something or the other. Yeah, I do find it interesting when some of the broadcast will say, you know, the manager's lost 4 0. Do you think perhaps it could have gone a bit better? <laughs> you know, it, it, it is they're so bad. Yeah. And then, so then they funny. say, well, after the first goal, the referee gave some terrible decisions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, it would have gone so well. Uh, another question, please. Yeah, at the front there. Um, I think you briefly touched on the subject of access and classically um, about not trying to um, and basically make terrible comments or criticise people that you want to interview in the future. And there's a classic Fergie who never wanted to be interviewed by the BBC because of that documentary about his son. And don't you think it's going to an extreme, though, that managers... I mean, I'm a United fan, but I want to hear, I want to hear Fergie. And quite frankly, the only time I'm going to hear Fergie is with the autobiography now. But it would have been nice to hear about at the time. Um, but it's got to the stage whereby even getting Mike Ashley, owner of Newcastle, banning like local reporters from attending press conferences now. Are we getting to a stage whereby, you know, owners and players and managers are actually doing to service the fans and maybe fans aren't helping themselves by not challenging this? Well, you raise an important point. Let me give you a Fergie story. This is the, the year that he first won the, the Premiership title um, and um, uh, um, uh, a colour magazine that I was writing for wanted, to do, wanted me to do a piece on Ryan Giggs and I asked his permission, and he wrote a letter to me saying, I don't want Ryan um, Giggs to be interviewed, I don't want him to go down the road of George Best, you know, and, and all the publicity that happened to George Best and so on. And then I was doing a column, and I wrote a column saying, you know, Alex Ferguson is wrong, what happened to George Best was not because of media publicity, there were other factors there. Mm -hmm. And then he came to collect his award, and he... Uh, he was very angry about the piece. He came to collect his award, um, and he said, oh, "Somebody called booze. Booze sounds like <laughs> Scottish broth to me." And you know, and Ferguson had that ability to be like a Hyde Park Corner speaker. You know, come to a press conference. Mm. If he didn't like you, he would he would target you. And the rest of the press, who you know, sort of didn't want their access to go, would sort of you know join in rather than <laughs> support you. you know, that, that was a great. Great Ferguson technique, but where we, and, and I've, you know, for my sins, I've been banned by Ken Bates. This was when Ken Bates had the technique that if a club was in trouble, the club he was running, he, he did it once with Chelsea and with Leeds, he would put the club into, into liquidation so that what would happen, of course, the football debts had to be paid, but the pie person wouldn't be paid, and he did that with Leeds. And he gave me an interview, but it happened to be, he was in Monaco, I was in Monaco, he gave me an interview, and of course he was filmed against the yachts. And then when the interview ran, and I also interviewed the person who supplied pies to Leeds and who wasn't being paid, and he said, this is dreadful, you've shown me as a rich man against the yachts. And I said, you know, if you're filmed in Monaco, it's very difficult <laughs> not to show you against the yacht. And, you know, I got banned, the BBC got banned from Leeds. I think where we haven't learned is we haven't gone down where the Americans have gone down. You know, the Americans allow access after the match to both their male and female reporters into the dressing room. Now, you will say our press is to blame, and, you know, I, I won't completely deny that maybe in the press we do tend to take, you know, the, what is the top line, you know, that sort of approach. Maybe we could do something, but also there is a very, we still have a sense that there are certain things you don't want to know. So, for instance, the real figures of transfers are never revealed. You know, what, what one club pays another club and what it has paid uh, agents is never revealed. And the fans think, you know, this club got 20 million for a player. But actually, it's not 20 million. It's 20 million dependent on if he makes 30 appearances in the Champions League, wins two trophies, you know, all sorts of things like that. And, and therefore, it, it distorts the, the argument. To a certain extent, the fans then say, what have they got? Where's the money gone? You know, what have they done with it? And, or the agent might have got, you know, 
I mean, nobody knows how much Gareth Bale's agent got for his. Yeah. I mean, Fast those are, whereas in America, they disclose salaries, they disclose, and we need to go, because football has become a business, we need to go down that route to more transparency. But then I think, in general, as a nation, we are not, we're not that inclined to give full details of everything, are we? No, although there's much more pressure in most walks of life than in, in sports. Yeah. Sport and I think this is tolerated. Is what, and this is where it's distorted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the guy. The point about America and the, the, the access they give and the way they control the caps in terms of what the players get and what the, what the club can spend, mm. don't you think that perhaps that should be introduced in, in certain the Premier League? I personally would like to see um, a sort of, the sort of sporting socialism that the, you know, Relegation and promotion is fine. That you know that should be there. Americans don't have it. But I personally think that from the beginning, right through the, the, the structure, and this should not just be in the Premier League, but go right down the leagues. There should be a limit to how much of how much money you can spend on wages. I mean, I don't often agree with Alan Sugar, uh, despite the fact that he owned Spurs. He's the one who told me when I asked him why he was buying Spurs. I said, is it because of the double? And he said, is that something from the 50s? You know, that was a great line. Uh, no, he says later on that it was meant to be a joke. I don't believe that. But anyway, he, he had a very good... Uh, he told the Premier League, when the Sky money is coming in and the other television money is coming in, don't give it all to us. Give 50% and keep the other 50% in a fund and give it if we want to build an academy or if we want to build a stadium and so on. But he says to me that, you know, people like Ken Bateson said, you know, Alan, this is our money. What, what do you mean we can't have it? You know, we need the money. And what has happened is it has gone to players' wages. It has gone to, you know, and, and it has also done another thing, talking community. If you talk to players of the 50s and 60s, the, the, the players, even at £10, Stanley Matthews was paid slightly more than the average industrial wage. But now, somebody like Beckham, there's no correlation. The, the, the fans can't feel. You know, Beckham is somewhere out there. You can, you can think of buying a, a club in America. Club or football. America. You see, yeah. this is where the gap has grown so huge yeah. that most, even players in the championship, earn more money than most of us do. You know? so yeah. Therefore, that gap, and that is the worrying thing, that uh, 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 at the end of the day, the players and the fans must have some relationship they might not drink together, but they must have a feeling that, you know, it's not too distant. I'm, I'm really intrigued by Ferguson. I'm probably the only person in this room who's read every word of the Alistair Campbell diaries. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Blair's press secretary. And if you look at the index of Campbell's diaries, you see quite a lot of Blair team and all the rest of it. But if you go to F, Ferguson A crops up again <laughs> and again and again. Uh, Alistair Campbell adores him. And as you, uh, you know, he's a fervent Labour supporter. And every now and again, you know, at the point actually when the Glazies uh, mm -hmm. were buying Manchester United and all the rest of it, uh, Alistair Campbell reports Alex Ferguson phoning Alistair up and saying, Oh, Alistair, Cathy, his, my wife, mm -hmm. thinks uh, Tony isn't left wing enough. <laughs> um, so, how did Ferguson, do you think, rationalise that kind of support for Labour? whilst presiding over the Glazier deal, earning millions, dealing with players, earning millions and millions. Do you think he didn't even bother? He just thought, you know, this is my world I'm in, but I used to come from the shipyards in Glasgow and that's where my politics will be. Or do you think any of those people who get involved in politics try and work through the craziness of the money they're earning? Well, I think Ferguson is a remarkable person. By the way, talking of Cathy, I'm told by Irving Scholar, the former chairman of Tottenham, that he had got Ferguson to come to Tottenham. It was Cathy who, who vetoed it. So oh, really? He was going to be manager of Scotland? Yeah, oh. this was many years ago. Uh, you know, this is what Scholar's version is anyway. Um, <laughs> the other version is that he didn't give, him, give Ferguson enough money in a long-term contract. But you can believe whichever version you like. But I think Ferguson is very clever. He, he certainly believes in his roots, but Ferguson is somebody who works out who he wants to be friendly with and who he wants to cultivate. And I remember Kate Hoey telling me that uh, just as she was appointed sports minister, um, Campbell told um, uh, her, do whatever you do, don't upset Ferguson. You know, and this was, if you remember, the year when Manchester United was stepping down from the FA Cup. In order oh, yes, to go, you know, right. and, you know and, 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 and the thing about Ferguson is that he, it's very interesting how he's played the, the fan. If you remember, he had this whole Rock of Gibraltar, uh, this, this was the horse, Rock of Gibraltar, where he was supposed to get the, get the rights, which is, in his latest book, dismissed in, in a couple of sentences. He doesn't, doesn't dwell on that at all. And, and when that was happening, all the fans were in favour of Ferguson, as a result of which 
the, the, the owners of the Rock of Gibraltar, the Magnias, got so upset that they, when the Americans came along, the glaciers, they sold the shares. And the fans thought Ferguson was opposed to the Americans. But actually, he loved the Americans. He got on very well yeah. with the Americans. So yes. he always knows, if you like, which side his bread was buttered on. But yeah. in that sense, yes. I mean, he's, he's done very well. He's earned a lot of money. You know, he's, he's cultivated uh, a fine taste in wine and so on and so uh. forth. And things like that. He's done, and he's also very careful in order to cultivate managers. So Mourinho, for instance, mm. is somebody who will never say a bad because, you know, Alex Ferguson after the match invites Mourinho and they discuss the quality of wine and things like that. So he knows how to reach out. Mm. And yet he can be a socialist. You know, you can earn yeah. a lot of money. And, and pay taxes and still be a socialist. So, and you advise know. <laughs> Tony Blair, which he did apparently much more than uh, Gordon Brown. Yeah. How do you think, if you like, the conventional media and the newspapers and the broadcast industry are going to justify their demands for access when players such as Joey Barton can use Twitter to completely rebuild their brand? Um, so mm. there is, the players don't need you as an access point anymore. Good question. Well, that, yeah, but that, that is the growth of Twitter that has come now, and the fact that somebody like Joey Barton, I think what is worrying for me as a journalist is, and maybe this is my old school of journalism, that I was taught in journalism that you developed contacts, that you, 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 made, you got to know people who actually did things. I think what is worrying now is that the younger journalists are just reporting news which is on Twitter, you know, and, and therefore what Joey Barton says. And I'm sure Joey Barton is, 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 is a modern-day Wittgenstein, but nevertheless, <laughs> you know, the idea that what Joey Barton says is great news is, is very hard to justify. Yeah. But, but I, 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 and this is where we're going, which is, which but is the tragedy. But the has done terrifically well with turning their website into a celebrity tracker. Yeah, well, yeah. um, they have been the most visited news site in the world one month, I remember, uh, 45 million visits. They're being successful in their online strategy, and it's that very celebrity-led one. Yeah, but it, it is celebrity-led. If you talk to my wife, who runs financial PR, she was doing a deal today where she was publicising a company, and even the FT said, you know, is, is this a celebrity person who's selling the company? You know, it, it, we, we are moving down that road. Yes. Where if you don't have a high-profile name, yes. you can't sell a story, you know. Yes. What, it's not what the story is. It is who is the person. Yes. And, 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 and unfortunately, that's a general trend not just in football, but to a certain extent, sport magnifies it. You know, yes. if Ian Botham says something, you know, if, if the captain of the England cricket team says something, or if the captain of the football team says something, it just becomes huge news, it, it, and it completely dominates. And now, rationally instance, huge news. Yeah, it becomes. I mean, for instance, a very good example is, is, is the whole monkey thing, you know. The, yeah. That's, that, okay, I, I, I personally don't believe Roy Hodgson is remotely racist. What he said was probably, you know, I, I accept his argument it was a generational thing, but the story did leak out. Yeah. Now, somebody from that dressing room must have leaked the story yeah. out. And, and, you know, if you think about it, football is all... Do you know who that was? Um, well, there are all sorts of uh, allegations. I mean, there, there have been stories that Ashley Cole was there, but Ashley Cole actually wasn't there. It, right. It was tweeted that it was Ashley Cole. Right. But, but I was told initially, because what happened was what Hodgson did was he didn't actually explain to the, to the, to the, to the, to the player that this was a NASA joke. He just said, Give, feed the monkey, and, you know, they didn't quite understand, yeah. you know. And, of course, they wouldn't have understood what NASA was. Because yeah. They're not part of the generation that, yeah. that cared much yeah. about the mood or whatever. The, the reference. Yeah. 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 If he'd come out and explained more at that point, it would have educated a lot of people. So why yeah, yeah, but you see, yeah, I think if you, if you have Philip Roth by your bedside, you know, you're, you're in that yeah. sense, you know, trying to educate, you know, if you watch his press conferences... He, he does have this, I mean, he's a, he's, a, he's a good think about the game, but I don't think he, he, he can, in that sense, empathise with somebody who's 20, who's worried totally yeah, different. He must have good yeah. PR advisors, yeah, just like players yeah. do. Yeah, there there would be an opportunity to, for someone to come in to feed that story yeah, out in an educational way, I think. Yeah, it's but you see, the, the, the strong yeah, growth... Has, has he talked about it publicly? He's sort of disappeared from view, hasn't he? The, yeah, he was, he was told by the FA... That, Not to. Yeah, to keep... keep well, maybe he should follow your advice. That's about someone who took football. Why was that? Well, because what tends to happen is that the, the, the FA, or many organisations in this situation, feel the less media attention, you know, if you say something more, then there will be more comments. So, you know, you try to say nothing at all. You know, you dampen it down. I hope that it will die down. Something else will come up. You know, in 24 hours there will be another story dominating and people will have forgotten. That's the feeling. Instead of trying to give a proper... Again, this is a question of there is no belief, that there is no belief that they have an obligation to explain what has happened. 
you know, they're, they're feeling it okay, you know, we're running our job, you know, it's all right, it's, it's, it's gone, it's, it's so yesterday. So how do you think he felt about that? Because he's yeah, I mean, uh, I, uh, I, you know, <laughs> I've been in touch with him and he, he sent me an email saying he, he just feels terrible that it, it was misinterpreted that way. And he feels genuinely wrong that it was misinterpreted. And of course, with the whole monkey situation, it's a slightly, we, we're moving into the whole area where race is an issue, where, you know, everybody um, feels, if, if, if at the slightest touch of something is racist. But obviously, it's, it's not often racist. I remember, uh, this is some years, a couple of years ago, we went to a Hearts versus Ibernian Scottish Cup final, which was a rare, you know, rare cup final where Celtic and Rangers were not there. And um, Hearts were winning 4-0, I think, and uh, the Hearts goalkeeper was Portuguese, and uh, the manager was Portuguese. The Hibernian manager was Irish, and my wife said, why don't you tweet that uh, the Hearts manager is wearing a suit, um, uh, Hearts manager in brackets Portuguese wearing a suit, the Hibernian manager in brackets Irish is not wearing a suit, does that explain the score? And I was accused of being racist. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's meant to be a joke. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, to criticize somebody as racist at that point is odd, because that assumed that um, uh, the Portuguese and the Irish only have one race in their country, you know, which is, which is not true. You know, I think we, if you live in that world, or if you, you know, with the modern world, it's instantly something is either good or bad. And I think sport, to a certain extent, makes you more judgmental. Because at the end of the day, a sporting match has a result. So therefore, it can't be, you know, either or. It, it has to be a fundamental result. It is another interesting contrast with politicians. Politicians are loathed, I know. But if anyone in politics had got quoted as saying monkey this or that, they would be on the Today programme at ten past eight yeah. the next morning having to explain every syllable yeah. Yeah. of it and would be in deep trouble until they had explained it on every media outlet. Well, that's what they should have Which done with Hodgson. Because Hodgson could have explained it. You know, he's intelligent enough to yeah. explain it. He wouldn't yeah. have been like Harry Redknapp saying, you know, <laughs> I was worried who's going to mark David Beckham. Yeah. You know, you know, said something, you know, something like that. So he could have actually explained it and, and, and made a proper defense of his case. Yes. But then yes. the FA, you know, the just FA just used to closing things down. You know, just to close things yeah. down. Yeah. 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 Do you think we, about racism, uh, in the second book, on that point about Boy Hudson, do you think we as a media would have made a big deal of it, a big deal of that monkey comment, if we were going to win the World Cup? Because I always think that we have a go in the managers when, you know, when we're down. We are, we've been down for a few years. Uh, I, well, no, I think, no, I think, Shaker, we are living in a world where because of what has happened in the past with racism, and we know how black players have had to struggle to come up and so on, and the whole picture of racism over a long time, I think we are rightly, to a certain extent, sensitive about anything that suggests that there is racism. But sometimes I think we go to, a, to, the, to the other extreme and find racism where there isn't racism, where there's an unfortunate remark, which probably, you know, was misunderstood. But I'm not... No, I think even if, you'd, if, you, even if we had won the World Cup, if Roy Hodgson had made a racist remark, I think that would have caused problems. But it's definitely not racist. We all know no, that no, that, but that, that, that would have... That would have okay, can I ask you about racism? Um, you asked Putin about racism in Russia yeah. when England lost the bid of the World Cup and they, they got it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's very brave of you. It's kind of again with Turi, Gaia Turi, you know, in Russia. So how do you see the World Cup going with racism? And is there enough being done on that, do you think? Well, I don't think enough is being done for the simple reason what has happened is that Yaya Toure's comment is interesting. Yaya Toure um, is, is, a, is a player, an African player, confident in his ability, confident in himself, also a person who earns a fair bit of money. So he's not worried about, you know, in Manchester City, you know, say he has to go, he, can, he knows he can look after himself. And, and these African players have a great sense of uh, obligation to their country. Most of them have foundations we put money back and do things and so on. And, and, and the problem there with Russia is that they would be in denial, you know, that these sort of things happen. If you remember, Shaker, what happened here in the, in the 70s and 80s for a long time... Why was it not that Why didn't John Oxman on television say, well, we can get a monkey chance under, under, you know, under a way we sit here? Why is it taking so long for, you know, for them to realise that it's, it's completely out of order? Yeah, but I think football is run by people in their 50s and 60s who do not understand the implication of what is happening, you know, the, the devastating impact on what is happening. And, you know, they, they come, and, and they are generally um, uh, well-meaning, um, white, and they've become not only middle class, but upper class, some of them, given the amount of money they earn, they do not understand the history of, the baggage of history of racism that, that, the, that the black players come from and how they feel when they hear a chant like monkey. 
You know, 20 years ago, when Garth Crooks was making his, 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 his debut for Stoke or for, for Tottenham, he was told, and you know, this was worse than that, you know, bananas were thrown and all sorts of things were thrown, and he was told, no, go and show on the football field what you can do. Keep quiet about it. So, you know, and, and the Yaya Tories of this world would not put up with that. But that's a big, big fundamental change in the way how players react to that sort of thing. You know, they're, they're willing to walk off. And if you remember, when, when players, just before the Euro Championship last year, when some of the players said, like Balotelli, they'd walk off, Platini said, no, you can't do that. But then you've got to get the referees to enforce, you know, to stop the game and say, fine, the game will be stopped. If you don't do that, and this is where football, to a certain extent, um, does not, because it is both regulator and, and if you like, prosecutor, it doesn't quite get its roles right, as, as the FA didn't get its roles right over, over the John Terry affair. Okay, I think, so, sorry, somebody on this side wanted to say something on this, no? Um, it was, oh, it was sorry, just, yeah. and then we better finish. It again. was just briefly um, um, about a um, point earlier on, which is just a comment, but I do wonder whether um, the Roy Hodgson monkey comment, whether actually, if Harry Redknapp had said something like that, which, similar to that, I doubt he would have, because he wouldn't have thought, known about Master either. Um, but um, if he'd said that, whether it would have been reported, because I do sometimes think with, um, with um, sports journalism that there's a definite favouritism that with certain managers, certain players, etc. I mean, there was so much stuff spoken negatively about um, Ashley Cole um, during you know, the last 10 or so years that obviously he stopped speaking to the press. And even I felt sorry for him after a while. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I just felt that, I just wondered with Roy Hodgson, there's been so much criticism of being, him being an England manager instead of Harry Redknapp. You just, I just wonder. You see, if, if you remember, been... Harry Redknapp, when Darren Bent was playing for Tottenham and he missed a goal, which was a very easy goal, he said, my wife Sandra would have scored. You know, that was his public comment. You know, it made, mm. it made me... Now, that is the sort of comment that, the, that, that uh, my colleagues on the back page is like, because, you know, you can splash it across. Mm. It has no collateral damage, you see. The, the monkey thing was different. It leaked out yeah. from, from, from the... No, Harry wouldn't have made that comment because, you know, Harry wouldn't have thought in those terms about, you know... Anyway, I, I don't think Harry knows about NASA, you know, you might think it's, a, it's an offshore account, you know, or something like that, you might think. But, you know, so I, I'm not sure he would have, you know, related to that. I, in, a, in a certain sense, I think Roy might have made that comment because he... He was trying to make a joke and impress, and, and he thought by making a joke, the player would remember better on the field rather than just say, pass the ball, you know, which they hear all the time, pass the ball is, you know, is, a, is, a, is a common enough thing. I, I, yeah, I agree with you that the back page is, but you know, at the end of the day, you've got to have a back page headline. You know, what is the top line? And, and modern journalism is all about the top line. I mean, you must find this in your copy, you know, what is the top line? What is the headline? And, you know, if you remember, old newspapers used to have four-deck headlines. You know, I'm going back 40, 50 years ago, you know. But now it doesn't work that way. We, you know, we, we live in that instant communication and you want to know, what did he say? You know, what did it mean, you know? Uh, and we want to know it instantly. And the problem with so much of what, is ha what happened at any time, I mean, I, I remember sometimes when the occasional, odd occasions I have got a scoop, I would ring the paper up and say, you know, this is a great story. And they'd say, well, what does it mean? I said, can I report the story before I work out what it means? You know, because you, you often don't know what the impact of a story is. Yeah. You know, you don't know it instantly. But I think we, we are trying to constantly analyse before we know all the facts. Yeah. It's interesting that Hodgson emailed you. He clearly yeah. is willing to bypass yeah. the yeah. FA to... Yeah, I, I'd written a piece of say, they're saying, you know, and, you know, Roy, you know, Roy... You know, Roy was probably, I, I quoted what Marcus of Salisbury is supposed to have said about Ian McLeod, he was a bit too clever by half, you know, and, and, I, I, and I sent him the piece and he sort of responded, you know, and, yeah. and he did respond to a couple of journalists who he knows. Who he, you know, he knows yeah. and trusts and raves. Well, this is anyone time for an urgent last question. An urgent last one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> urgent last question. Yeah. And um, you talked a lot about access to the, um, to the politicians and the sportsmen and the rumours that surround them, and then comes the super injunction. There's so many you can't report it. What well, the dilemmas have you been put into personally around those sorts of legal actions that suddenly so silence you? Well, I personally think that the personal lives of footballers 
is not something I'm particularly interested in, in reporting. So, you know, those super injunctions relate to that. I've had to f fight legal battles when, when I reported on Terry Venables and other cases and so on, and which, is, which is quite difficult because, you know, you've got to prove, in, in, we have libel laws, unfortunately. Did he threaten to sue you? In fact, yes, what happened was when I was writing my book on Venables, um, he, um, he, he sued me on a story I'd done for the Sunday Times two years ago, three years ago. In, in those days, you could sue for, uh, after, within three years. And what he did was he actually served the writ, not on the Sunday Times, but on me personally at home. Really? Say, and, 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 and it was quite clear that he served the writ. Uh, and it was quite clear that if I withdrew the book, you know, the writ would go away. You know, it was, it was, because normally uh, the judges don't give a, 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 a writ to stop a book. They, they yeah. allow the book to be published and, you know, and they fly with it. I mean, to me, that is, is, is more fundamental. If we have a revision of the libel laws along the lines of America, where if you, if you, if you commit libel, you have to prove the person who's, who's alleged to have been, who suffered the libel, is, has to prove that the journalist uh, reported maliciously. That that's, that's a different matter. I think that would actually encourage our journalists to report on issues. Because our, often the real stories can't be reported because you can't get it past the lawyers. And the law, you know, the, the legal fees are heavy. And, and what has happened since with Levison is going to make it even worse, I think. I mean, the super injunctions, yes. If it's a personal story, that, that, you know, that's a, you know, what he does in his private life, I'm not really concerned with that, personally speaking. I can see why papers uh, have built this up, you know, whoever is doing what. But that's, you know, to me, that's not, not, not much relevance. It, it, it's a super injunction is about a story that stops you understanding what is happening about a club, its finances, or why a certain transfer is not taking place, or whether a bung was paid. That would worry me, and that has occasionally happened. Okay, thank you. Well, before I thank you here, I just thought I'd tell you about how this is developing the journalists on stage. Tomorrow, John Pina will be here. He's done the sort of almost the opposite of the two of us, actually. He's started...